So you'll notice that the setup has changed and that's because I'm becoming a baby, as my German friend would say. So I'm having a baby girl and I've had to change my office into a nursery. <laughs> so it's good news and, well it's not bad news, but it's just a change. So now I'm in the spare room and I've had to shove this up here. So apologies if it's um, a little bit weird. That's why I've been away as well for the past week. I've been sorting the nursery out. So, welcome to part nine of our Learn to Program with C tutorial. In this part, we're going to cover arrays. But before we cover arrays, we need to go over the homework for last week, which was to write a function to print out the first X Fibonacci numbers. So if you didn't watch that episode, just briefly, the Fibonacci numbers are the first two are 0 and 1, and then the next number is always determined as being the sum of the previous two numbers. So, so it's 1 again, then it's 2, sum of 2 and 1 is 3, it's 5, 8, and so on. And I said that the homework was to define a function void fib, it took a single integer argument x, and it was to print out the first x numbers. So. This would be the first number, so if this is 1, it just prints out 0. If it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If it's the fifth number, if x is 5, then we print out all the way up to the 3. So that was the homework. Let's take a look at a couple of solutions for that. So let's go ahead and do this exercise. The first thing we need to do, of course, is define our function. We said it had the following signature. It's void. It's called fib, it takes an integer called x, and we're going to print out the first x Fibonacci numbers. So what do we need to do? Well, what we know is that the each successive Fibonacci number is the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. And we know that the first two Fibonacci numbers are 0 and 1. Now let's store those values in variables called x, called a and b. So the first two numbers are 0 and 1. And what we're going to do, we're going to write this function, and within this function, a and b will always represent the last two Fibonacci numbers relative to wherever we are in the succession. We're going to need some space to compute the next Fibonacci number, so we'll call that c. And we're just going to give it the value 0 to begin with, and it doesn't really matter. Now the first thing we want to do is, somebody might call this with a negative integer, or well, they might call it with an integer value of 0. And we said that our indexing starts at zero, at 1. So if somebody calls it with x equal to 1, we want to print out the first Fibonacci number 0, and that's it. But anything less than that, we want to ignore. So we're going to say if x is less than or equal to 0, then just do nothing. Just return. Just print nothing. And we're protecting ourselves against someone trying to put a negative number in or trying to do something that we don't want the program to do. Now, what we're going to do next, and this is just the first thing that's came to my mind, there's plenty of different ways you could write this. We're going to say, we're going to kind of hard code the first two numbers. So if x equals 1, it's the first number, then we're just going to print out the first number. And we're going to reference the variable rather than explicitly printing 0, in case we for some reason want to change this function later and start the Fibonacci sequence from some other index. You know, we want to start it at the tenth number, then we could go up here and change the value a. Once we've done that, if x is 1, we just want to return, because we're done. Now, we can either put another if statement, statement here, or we can say, else if x equals 2, then we want to print out the first two Fibonacci numbers. And again, we're just going to hard code this, and we know that's a and b. So now we've dealt with those two cases. So now we know that x is not less than or equal to 0, so x is greater than 0, it's not 1, it's not 2, x therefore must be greater than 2. So f what we're going to do is first of all print out the first two numbers, because we know we've got to print out the first two, and again we'll reference them directly, and now we want to print out however many numbers we need to print out to get to the x that was specified. So if x is 3, that means we're just going to print one more number out. If x is 10, we're going to print out 8 more numbers, and so on. So we're going to do that using a loop. So we're going to create a new loop, and we're going to start i at 3. 
because we know that that's where we are in the index. We've already done one and two. We've handled those cases, so we know we must start at three. The person might have passed three, and then we want to print out the third number and stop. But if the, if the number is greater than three, then we want to print them all out. So we're going to say i is less than or equal to x. So if x is three, it will still print out the third number. But if x is greater than three, then it will print out up until that number. And we're just going to increment. Now what we're going to do then, we need to know what the next Fibonacci number is. And we know at this point in our program, a and b are the, are the last two numbers. In fact, at this point in our program, when we first entered the loop, they're the first two Fibonacci numbers. So we're going to calculate the next one in the sequence, which is a plus b. So c is the next Fibonacci number. So let's just print that out. Actually, we want just realize we don't want to put a new line there because we want to print out all of them. Now what we're going to do is print out the next Fibonacci number. So there we go. C is the next number. It's just the sum of the last two, which is what the Fibonacci sequence is. But now what we want to do is the next time we come around this loop, we want A and B to be the last two Fibonacci numbers. So the way to do that then is we're going to say that A is now equal to B. So we're kind of shifting B to the left, if you imagine, in the sequence. And now B is equal to C. So then A and B now represent what was formerly B and C, if that makes sense. So we've now got our new calculated value becomes B, and the former value of B now becomes A. So A and B, when we go around the loop again, will again be the last two Fibonacci numbers. So we'll calculate the next Fibonacci number correctly, and we'll print that out. And that will go on until i equals x, So and then we'll be done. The only thing left to do is print out a new line. Now let's try and call this with the number 5. And there you go, that's the first five Fibonacci numbers. Um, to test this out, what we can do is we'll have another loop down here. i equals 1, starting at index 1. And we'll wait until i is equal to 10. And we're just going to print out the i the first i Fibonacci numbers. So let's compile that. I'm just going to clear the screen and run that. And there you go. So that's Fibonacci called with 1, with 2, with 3, with 4, with 5, with 6, with 7. And you can see that in each case, the number that we're printing out, or the last Fibonacci number, is always the sum of the previous two numbers. So the Fibonacci sequence there is correct. And of course it's correct, because we defined our logic to be like that. So there you go. One quick thing to point out is doing this kind of thing, you know, protecting against the user putting in invalid input is always something that should be on your mind when you're programming. We haven't really covered that in the previous examples because we're focusing on the fundamentals of the programming language. But when you're writing a program, just try and be aware that the, the computer or the user may put in a number you didn't expect. So you should always try and think what's going to happen. And when you're writing tests for your programs, just try and think all of the crazy things that could happen. Even if someone was trying to be malicious, try and think of those as well. Just think how you could break the program and try and protect against that. Right. So what is an array? An array is a sequence of objects. And those objects are types. So it might be a sequence of integers, doubles, or well, later on, you'll see you can have structures, which are kind of compound types. But it's just a block of them all in a row. To make that clear, I'll show you how you define an array in C. So we could define an array having five values like this. Int. So first of all, we provide the type. Let me provide the name of the array. So let's call it A. And we then write square brackets and then we write the size. So 5. And that's actually our declaration of an array that has 5 integers in it. We can assign values to that array using the curly brackets and then we'll give it the values 1, 2, 
three, four, five. So that has now declared an, an array called A that has five values, and they are the five values. So that's one way to declare and define an array. What we can also do is just declare the array. We can just stop at this point and put a semicolon here. And then our, our array A will just have undefined values. We don't have to specify the size if we provide the values because the C compiler will infer the size from the number of values we provided. So we can also write int a square brackets equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We can also do that. So now we've declared an array. So how do we actually access those values? Well, we access the values by what's called indexing the array. So if we were to write printf, and then we want to print out an integer, so we're using the percent sign %d, we could print out the first value is in, in this array by writing the array name then an open square bracket, the index, and then a closed square bracket. So that will print out the value 1. Arrays are always indexed from the index 0. So 0 is the, always the first value of an array. The reason for this, you might be thinking, well, why don't you index an array at 1? And there are other programming languages, in MATLAB, for example, they index an array at 1. But in C, you index the array at 0. And the reason for this is because it's tied closely to how this array is stored in memory. So let's imagine that our array is stored in memory at index 0 in memory. So the very beginning of memory. And the value 1 is then stored in there. And if we assume that each integer is 32 bits, that's 4 bytes, we'll just assume that, whether or not that's true, it doesn't matter. And I'm going to draw a byte as a, a square. Then the first 4 bytes are going to be here, and then our next byte, our next integer, is going to be an address 4, because we're 4 bytes in. Now, if you imagine that this, this first byte is at address 0, the next byte is at address 1, address 2, address 3, and then the next byte is at address 4. So the reason and don't worry if this doesn't make sense, you don't need to understand it to use arrays. So the reason that we index from 0 in C is because when it wants to find, say, so this will be at index 0, right? And this will be at index 1, these, um, these integers. Now, when we want to access 0, the zeroth element of array A, we just need to know that we just take the memory address and our value will actually be there. It's here. When we want index 1, so it will be this value here, we know that we want this, these four bytes here in memory. And then the compiler knows, because it knows that a, an integer is 4 bytes long, for example, it just needs to add on 4 times whatever the index is. 4 times 0 is 0, so for the first, for the 0th index we get here, 4 times 1 is 4, so for the first index we get here, 4 times 2 is 8, so for the second index we get here, And so on. So it's actually kind of 
a historical convention simply for speed because there's some assembler operations which add memory addresses and this is the most efficient way to do it is indexing from zero and it makes semantic sense when you're thinking about memory addresses where the elements of your array actually are located so that's why we index from zero but as I said don't worry if that doesn't make sense right now but in, when you become an advanced C programmer or even an intermediate C programmer it is useful to know where things are in memory especially if you're writing in code for embedded systems where you might have to know exactly where things are in memory if you want to reverse engineer anything also it's useful to know where things are in memory so that's how we declare and define an array that has five values, an integer array. So it has five elements, we call them, the elements of the array. I think we should have a quick look at an example of this before moving on. So why might you want to use arrays? There are loads of different reasons, but to give a quick example, imagine you recorded the temperature of your greenhouse every hour for 24 hours and then at the end of each day you print out the values or send them via post to you somehow using a weird machine um, then you need 24 spaces to store each of the values because it's only once a day you're printing them out so there's a very simple example but there's loads of reasons or loads of cases where you're going to want to store lots of different values so we've got a file called helloarray.c and in our make file we've got a, one default that says hello array. So let's declare an integer array called a having five values and their values are one, two, three, four, five. And we're just going to print out the value at index zero of the array. So if I compile that and run it, and the value is one. Just so it's explicitly clear, let's give these some just random values, you know. Compile that again and print out. So the zeroth element is there. Now we can explicitly print out the first five elements by doing this if we really want. And there we go, we've printed out the, all those elements. Now, notice that the last element is always the array size minus one, because we start at zero, so we're always going to end up with the last element being the array size minus one. That's quite useful, because we might, later on, we're going to construct arrays dynamically. So we're not going to define them, we're going to... This is called a static array declaration. And what this means is that the array has been defined, declared and defined in one line and it's going to be statically compiled into the code. So it's, we can change the values but we're not dynamically constructing this, we're not constructing it in the code. To give you an example, we can dynamically assign values to the array as follows. So if we just declare A like that and we don't define it, well actually let's see what happens if we just print that out. We'll see what values we actually get. And you can see that they're actually just garbage values because we didn't define what they are. So whatever the memory was at that point, we are now printing out. And this is actually a source of many bugs, undefined memory space or undefined arrays or any other type of object that takes up space in memory can cause undefined behavior. If we were to assume that that had been set at zero, for example, by the compiler, and sometimes in the past certain com compilers had certain conventions and so on, or perhaps someone just makes a mistake, and we were to rely on the fact that this might be zero, then we're going to have a problem when this number comes up, right? So whenever we define or declare an array, we need to define its values. We don't have to define them immediately. So we can actually now write a loop to define these values. And so we'll say 
a0 equals i times 2. Okay? And then we're going to print out the values. And of course, we don't really need to do this explicitly like this anymore. Because we know what we're doing. We can do another loop and just print out the ith number. So let's compile that. What have I done wrong there? I hope you've spotted it. I, just, I genuinely made that mistake, I just wasn't thinking. But of course, I was showing you the example where we assign the value a zero. We want to assign the ith value, of course. There we go. So now we're assigning the, the zeroth value is gonna have i times two, so zero times two. The first value is gonna have two times one, two times two, two times three, two times four, and so on. And this would be called dynamically defining the array, or programmatically defining the array, because we're defining the values of the array elements programmatically, dynamically, at runtime, not statically. They're not part of the data of the code, if you see what I mean. We can't look at the code and determine the, their values explicitly like we could when we actually assigned it explicitly. And this might depend on runtime parameters. Like we might get some user input to define this array value. So that's why it's dynamic. Like we can't necessarily a priori, without running the program and providing input, understand what the values of A are going to be. In this case, we can in infer them because we can see. But if we took external input, you know, we probably couldn't. So that would be a dynamic, dynamically assigning values to the array. And so we've learned a couple of things here. One is that we can assign values to an array by providing the index, just like we would any other variable. And we can access them by providing the index as well. Now, you might be wondering what happens if we access an element that's outside the bounds of the array. Well, let's try that. Let's just try printing out essentially the fifth index which is outside of our bounds. Let's see what happens. Well, in this case, we get garbage because we're just printing out that memory address as an integer. It happens to be a zero. Now, that isn't very particularly dangerous, just printing out a value that's sort of outside of the bounds of the array. You know, we can even put in like 10 here and just print out you know, ending up with complete garbage. That isn't particularly dangerous, printing out values, as long as they're not used elsewhere, because we're just printing the memory out. I mean, it could be dangerous if we were leaking information, like in terms of security, but it's probably not going to crash the program, just printing information out. But what is much more insidious is if we do something like this, and we try and assign a value outside of where we've allocated memory. And now this could cause any type of behavior. In this case, what's happened here? Well, we've actually got the correct value. But notice that C has not actually complained about this. C has allowed us to go outside the bounds of our array. And we can go far outside the bounds of our array if we want. Now, this is why people will say that C is dangerous for beginners. Because you can do things like this. And what will happen here is, if we've just assigned values to these areas of memory that were beyond the bounds of our array. So as soon as we use a number that's 5 or bigger, because the last index is four, remember? It's one less than whatever the size is. We're actually just assigning to memory that was not, we didn't say that we wanted to use that. We didn't tell the compiler that we wanted to use that. So that memory might be used by someone else. And we're overwriting those values and that can cause all kinds of spurious behavior. And so this is really, I guess, one of the first times where you've seen that C can be dangerous. You need to know what you're doing and think about what you're doing. It's a very common error.
to go outside the bounds of an array and overwrite memory. Luckily, there are tools like Valgrind or dmalloc, which we'll go into later, which can help you look for those kind of problems, which might only show up at runtime. You know, perhaps you, you've done something where you've taken user input and you've determined what you're going to loop up to. Or perhaps you change the size of the array for some reason and forget to change the index, you know? There's all kinds of reasons why you might accidentally go outside the bounds of your array. And it might not show up. There's no error showing up here. But later on, if we added more variables and so on, we could cause an insidious error. And one of the most common errors, the security vulnerabilities in C, comes from what's called a buffer overrun. <laughs> Uh, for C strings, and this is precisely what's happening in a buffer overrun. It so happens that the bounds checking is not done, and user input is taken, which then spills out and is, is just copied into memory addresses which don't belong, essentially, to the variable that you're copying into. And then that allows a user externally to write to memory that's that it's not supposed to write to and because of the way memory is structured in C in the way that um, the stack is used when functions are called you can actually overwrite the return address <laughs> on the stack and get somebody else's program to run your code that you pass to it and this is called a buffer overrun so it's really crucial actually that you pay good attention to the bounds of your array. Like what you might want to do is use a define. We haven't gone into defines yet, but define is like another way to specify a, it's uh, it's called, a, it's a macro and it's substitution, called macro substitution. So we can do this, we can do array size five, and then we can use the, um, the macro array size, and it will just take the value five. When we compile it, this will be substituted with the value five. And then we could do something like this. And we can compile that and run it. And we're not gonna go outside our bounds because we've used this in place of actual numbers. So we're much less likely to kind of make a mistake and have a different number there. And in modern C, we can even do this, the following. So if I get rid of that, we could have our a size here. So this has got a variable sized array. And you can even do this. This will work. Same thing. We can do that in C. So that last method of declaring the size of an array using another variable to provide the size, as in size underscore a equals five, and then declaring our array to have a size equal to that variable, to the value of that variable, is incredibly powerful because it allows one to create an array that depends on another variable. So within a function, you might need to store a certain number of values. So for example, you might pass... So for example, if you wanted to store a number of temperature readings or whatever, perhaps you want to say in advance, I only want to store 100. And then the function that perhaps captures those values could then pass in the parameter to specify that this array only contains 100 values. And the only other way to do that in C, without doing it this way, would be to dynamically am allocate the memory for the array, which we're going to look at in another tutorial. So this method of sizing an array was actually only introduced in C99. And actually, there's a lot of people that don't know that you can do this, because previous to this, you could only have a static value. You couldn't pass in a variable. 
So you, you'd have to say the number five or whatever size you wanted the array to be. It's only in C99 that you can do this, and this is really powerful. So if you're learning C for the first time, it's useful to know this. Um, if you look on, say, Stack Overflow about variable sized arrays, <laughs> You'll see people who perhaps even have good ratings and so on saying, oh, you can't do it. You can't size an array like that. And then someone will say, yeah, you can. Just provide a standard C99. And then they'll be like, oh, yeah, you can. So you can do this. So just to explicitly kind of cover the cases about defining and declaring arrays, we can do the following. So we can just declare an array that has five elements like that. And then we can assign the values to it later using a loop or whatever. We can declare it having a size 5 and then explicitly define the values to it straight away. Or we can declare it without specifying the size. But the only time we can do that without specifying the size is when then we explicitly define the values. We can't have, we can't do this. Because C doesn't know how big to make the array then. You can do it in this case because we've got the number of elements and it can do it in this case because we've specified the number of elements and in this case we've specified the number of elements. So there are different ways you can declare and in some cases define the elements of the array even in that last case of using a variable to provide the sizing information for the array, we are still limited and essentially what we're doing are kind of statically allocated arrays, even though there is some kind of automatic array sizing happening when we use a variable for the size. So. This and this tutorial is going to be about those kind of arrays. So either that have a fixed size or use a variable to provide the size. We're going to look at dynamically sized arrays using proper dynamic sizing and memory allocation in another tutorial. We're also going to look at passing arrays into functions in another tutorial because it's linked to pointers. And pointers are integral to memory allocation. So we kind of need to look at both. But we can still say quite a bit more about arrays without going into those dynamically sized arrays. We can declare multi-dimensional arrays, for example, like this. So you can actually put as many brackets after the A or after the array name as you want and put different numbers in there. And that will allow you to specify this will be a 5x5 five five array. So essentially a 5x5 five five matrix. And this will be row indexed, what's called row index, in that the first, the index here will essentially be the row of the matrix, and the index here will be the column. To give an explicit example of that, I'll just use a smaller, smaller array. So say we had a 3x3. Three then we're going to have show them on, A, 0, 0, A, 0, 1, and A, 0, 2. Then the next row is going to be A, 1, 0, A, 1, 1, and then A, Two, two, and the last row. Well, it's going to be a two zero, a two one, and a two two. So that's all of the indices of this three by three matrix, if you like. And the reason then it's row index is because the the first number that we pass in essentially specifies the row of the matrix, whereas the second number specifies the column of the matrix. So you can specify a two-dimensional array or a matrix like that, and you can 
make a three dimensional array by adding another number in there, or a four dimensional, or a ten dimensional array, whatever you want actually, by doing that. Let's take a quick look at an example of that. So let's take a look. So we're going to declare an array, and I'm a little bit sick of integers, so let's make it a double, and it's going to be three by three. Now we can actually define the values of it like we did before using braces, but there's no kind of separation or between the the rows, and I'll show you what I mean. So we have to kind of use the white space layout in order to show it in a kind of matrix form. So say we just gave it the values one, two, three, that would be our first row, four, five, six, our second row, and then our third row. If you see, if I show you, this is actually just, just looks like this, right? So if you see what I mean, there's no sort of explicit support for saying this is a matrix. You you have to provide that semantic information in your layout. That doesn't tell the compiler anything. The fact that we've got new lines there means nothing. It's just white space. This is just when you're reading it so that it helps. We can have it like that if we want, and it's exactly the same as that. This is just easier to read and see see it as a matrix, if that information might be useful. So now that we've done that, we can then go through and we could print the values out. So we could do something like this. We could have a nested loop, for, for loop. And then we can just print out, uh, let's print out the indices and the value. And the value was a double, right? So we're going to print out the indices and then the value. And to get the value for the i-th row and the j-th column, then we just put put the numbers for the indices in the brackets following the array name. So let's have a look what that does. Let's compile that and run it. And now we can see all of the indices. Zero, row zero, column zero has a value one up to nine like that. So you can see how it's indexed. We can also, if we wanted just to declare this first and then define the values, we could do something like this. Aij equals i times j, for example. And then just let's print the value of that out, as we did before. Compile that. Uh, oh yeah, it's a double. In this case, we're using the fact that we're using a double is pretty irrelevant because we're not actually computing any floating point numbers. But anyway, and there we go. Now this time, the value in row i and column j is equal to their product. So since these are all zeros, the product is zero. And whenever we've got a zero, the product's going to be zero. Anyway, so that's how you can use a two-dimensional array. And you can have a three-dimensional array. We could just add on another dimension here at the top. And we could add on another level of nesting if we wanted in another index, like k. And we could do something like this. I'll do the same here. Mm, put in another index. AIJ. Okay, we're going on to a new line. So, yep, there we go. Let's compile that. And run it. And yeah, we've done the same thing, but with a three dimensional array. So, hopefully, you can see from that that. It's easy to declare arrays and assign values to them and then retrieve values to them. So you've seen how to de declare a statically sized array, either using a number to provide the sizing or using a variable to provide the sizing. And you've seen that that can be multi-dimensional, as many dimensions as you want. It's easy once you've 
declared it to define the values by using array indexing, just using the brackets and numbers. Arrays are indexed from zero. Every dimension is starts with its index at zero. And I hope you can see that it's quite straightforward stuff. In the next episode, we're going to look at dynamically sizing arrays and pointers to arrays, because that will allow us to pass them to functions. Once we've done that, we're then going to look at character arrays or strings, because they have a slightly special treatment in C, but they're essentially just arrays of characters with some special additions. So that's it for the first part of our arrays, um, the array basics. I can't think of an exercise, um, so just mess around with the examples and, until you become comfortable with arrays. And I'll see you next time for more adventures in C.